So we are going to prove Gauss's lemma, which is a result in number theory that's primarily used to show the important theorem called quadratic reciprocity. In order to prove that, we're going to use Euler's criterion, so if you aren't familiar with that, I've left a video on it in the description. The method for proving Gauss's lemma is very similar for the method of proving things like Euler's totient theorem. We're going to construct two different sets. We're going to show that the elements of the first set are congruent to the elements of the second set in some order. And then when we take the product of the first set and the second set, things will cancel out and we'll get our final result at the end. To start, we'll let p be some odd prime number. And since it's odd, we know that p minus 1 will be even, and therefore p minus 1 over 2 will be an integer. So we'll call that integer n. We'll also define another integer m, which we say is co-prime to p, meaning m is not a multiple of p. The first thing we're going to do is construct the set s. And this set s is going to contain the elements m, 2m, 3m, 4m, 5m, and so on, up to n times m. Next, we'll construct a second set t. And the way that we get t is by taking each element of s and reducing it mod p. But we're going to reduce it in a specific way. Because normally when we talk about reducing a number mod p, we say that the number is going to be between 0 and p. But in this case, we're going to say that the elements of t are going to be in the interval negative p over 2, p over 2. So we're going to reduce the numbers mod p until each element of s ends up somewhere in this range. And since the range has length p, we know that every number is going to end up somewhere in there. We're going to look at the properties of the elements in t. To start out, remember that we defined m to be co-prime to p. What that means is that multiplying by m is an injection mod p. So if we think about the coefficients next to the m's in this set s, we have 1, 2, 3, and so on, up to n, which is p minus 1 over 2. All of those numbers are incongruent mod p, since they're all less than p. That means that when we multiply by m, we're going to get a set of numbers in here that are all incongruent mod p. When we reduce the mod p, that means they're still going to be different numbers. So we know that the elements in t are all different. Additionally, we know that m is not a multiple of p. And since all of the coefficients here, 1 up to p minus 1 over 2, those are all less than p, none of them are going to be multiples of p either. That means that when we multiply them together, none of these numbers in s could be a multiple of p, because they don't have a factor of p anywhere. If we reduce them mod p, that means that they're not going to be equal to 0. So since none of these are multiples of p, when we reduce mod p, the elements of t are all going to be non-zero. Now we'll look at one more restriction on t, which will be crucial to the final proof. Let's think about what would happen if we had two elements in t, the first one being t1 and the second being t2, where t2 is negative t1. So the elements are negatives of each other. We know that this means that t1 plus t2 has to equal 0. What we're going to do is take this equation and think about what that means in the context of the original set s. Remember that each of the elements in t came from an element in s, except that we reduced the element mod p. So if we think about t1, for example, t1 is in t, which means t1 comes from some element s1 in s, except the difference between t1 and s1 is a multiple of p. We can say the same thing about t2. It came from some number s2, and the difference between these two numbers is a multiple of p. Well, if we add these two together, this is t1 plus a multiple of p. This is t2 plus a multiple of p. So when we add them, we're going to get a multiple of p on the other side of the equation. But now, what are these numbers s1 and s2 exactly? Well, we know that every element in s is some multiple of m. So we could write s1 as j1 times m, and we could write s2 as j2 times m. But in this case, we know that m is co-prime to p. So if we need this left side expression to equal some multiple of p, m doesn't have a multiple of p, so we need j1 plus j2. Those two coefficients in front of the m's, those need to add to a multiple of p. 
But we know that the coefficients that go in front of the m's in our set here, those are between 1 and p minus 1 over 2. So if the biggest possible value of j is p minus 1 over 2, even if we had two of those together, we're still going to get p minus 1, not big enough to be a multiple of p, which means no matter what elements we choose out of the set s, there's no way for this equation to be true. s1 plus s2 is never going to be a multiple of p. And that means this equation is not true. So the assumption that led us to that equation, this assumption right here, has to be false. There are no elements in t that are negatives of each other. And that's the third restriction that we can put on the set t. These three restrictions on t give us a lot of information about what the elements in t look like. So let's investigate that a little more. We know that every element in s will give us one element in t, and they're all different. We also know, because s was constructed as 1m, 2m, 3m, up to nm, that there are p minus 1 over 2 elements in s. And since each element in s goes to 1 in t, we know that there are p minus 1 over 2 elements in t. Let's think about what would happen if all of the elements in t were positive, so we don't have any negative elements in t. How many numbers do we have on the interval 0 to p over 2? Well, first of all, we know that none of the elements in t are equal to 0. And also, because p was an odd prime number, we know that p over 2 is not an integer. So none of the elements in t could equal p over 2. The next greatest integer, the first integer less than p over 2, is going to be p minus 1 over 2. So the integers that exist in this interval, except for 0, are going to be 1, 2, 3, and so on, up to p minus 1 over 2. So we've shown that this is the set of all possible positive numbers that could be in the set t. But we also know that t has exactly p minus 1 over 2 elements, which means that this set here is actually a possible instance of the set t. This gives us p minus 1 over 2 numbers, which are all different, all non-zero, all in this interval. And of course, none of them is the negative of the other because they're all positive. So this is one possibility for t. But we know that there are other possibilities. For example, instead of having a positive 1 in the front here, we could have a negative 1. And that wouldn't violate any of our conditions. The only thing that would violate our conditions is if we had a set t that included, for example, both 1 and negative 1. Because in this case, we have two elements where t2 equals negative t1, and that's not allowed. So for any of these numbers, we can switch the sign. We just can't have both the positive and negative version. And from that, we can actually realize what our set t looks like in terms of all of the possibilities. We know that we could have all positive numbers, or we could flip the 1 to a negative 1, or we could flip the 2 to a negative 2, or we could flip the 3 to a negative 3, or we could do any combination of those. In other words, the set of all possibilities for t is going to look like plus or minus 1, we can choose either one, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and so on. Every single number can be either positive or negative, and then finally, at the end, we have plus or minus p minus 1 over 2. So this is exactly what our set t looks like. No matter what s is, no matter what it ends up being, no matter what the value of m is, our final set t is going to look like this with some specific choice for which of these elements is positive and which are negative. Now remember that we got the set t by taking the elements in s and reducing each one mod p. What that means is that each element in t is congruent to one element in s mod p. And this is the part where we take the product of each of the sets. Because of the multiplication rule for modular arithmetic, if all the numbers in s are congruent in some order to all of the elements in t, then we know the product of every single s sub i in our set s has to be congruent to the product of all of the elements t sub i of t mod p. 
And now that we have this congruence, we can actually expand out each product in terms of the actual elements in the sets and see what we get. On the left side, we're multiplying all of the elements of s. So that's going to give us m times 2m times 3m times and so on up to this last element n times m. That's the left side. That's going to be congruent to the product of all the elements of t, which are going to be plus or minus 1 times plus or minus 2 times plus or minus 3, and all the way up to p minus 1 over 2 we know is equal to n. So this last element is plus or minus n, which means that these two expressions on the left and right have to be congruent mod p. Now let's think about whether we can cancel anything on the left and right side. Notice that on the left we have 1 times 2 times 3 and so on up to n. And on the right we also have 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n. Because p is prime, no number less than p shares any factors with p. All the numbers from 1 to n are going to be less than p, which means they're all going to be co-prime to p. So by the cancellation rule for modular arithmetic, we can cancel them out. This 2 cancels with that 2, this 3 cancels with that 3, and so on. Those are all going to cancel out. So what does that leave us? On the left side, we have a bunch of multiples of m. And the number of multiples of m is p minus 1 over 2. So we have m to the power of p minus 1 over 2. That's congruent to what we have on the right. What's left on the right? Well, after we cancel all these numbers, 1, 2, 3, up to n, we're left with a bunch of plus or minus multiplied together. So how can we express that? Well, if we multiply a certain amount of negatives together, what that's going to leave us is negative 1 to some power. And we'll call that power v mod p. So v is talking about the number of negatives that we multiply on the right side. How many is that? Well, each of the numbers on the right side that we're multiplying, those all come from the set t. So v is equal to the number of elements in t that are negative. That corresponds to how many negatives we multiply on the right side. Now let's take a look on the left because we can do one more simplification. We know something called Euler's criterion which tells us that m to the power of p minus 1 over 2, that's congruent to m on p mod p. In this case, m on p is the Legendre symbol, so it tells us whether m is a quadratic residue mod p. So since this is congruent to m on p mod p, we're working with a congruence mod p over here, so we can substitute this in. m on p is congruent to negative 1 to the v. But now remember that the Legendre symbol, m on p, that's going to be either 1 or negative 1. And similarly, negative 1 to the power of v, that's going to be either 1 or negative 1. So there's no way for those two to differ by a multiple of p, except when they are equal. In other words, the multiple is 0. So instead of just saying that they're congruent mod p, we can get more specific and say that they have to be equal. So m on p is equal to negative 1 to the power of v, where v is the number of negative elements in the set t. So what exactly did we just prove? What is the final result of Gauss's lemma? It's this. Suppose we take some number m, which is co-prime to p. First, we'll construct the set s, which is the multiples of m, all the way up to p minus 1 over 2. Then we're going to construct a new set by reducing each element of s mod p until it's in the interval negative p over 2 to positive p over 2. Out of those elements, some are going to be negative. If the number of negative elements in the second set is v, then we know the Legendre symbol m on p is equal to negative 1 to the power of v. Now theoretically, we could use this final result to calculate whether a number is a quadratic residue. We could construct this set, reduce the numbers, and count how many are negative. But one of the biggest consequences of this lemma, and what we'll show next, is that we can use this to prove a very important theorem called quadratic reciprocity.